from RTV6, the only place to see the race. This is Trackside 6. Good evening and welcome to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the world's largest spectator facility and of course home to the greatest spectacle in racing. I'm Dave First and in just 17 days, this track will play host to the 96th running of the Indianapolis 500. And I'm Brad Brown. For the next three weeks, RTV6 is the place to get all of your Indy 500 information. Our Trackside 6 team has you covered from the garages, along pit lane, and throughout the city as the eyes of the world focus on Indianapolis once again. And it all starts right here, right now, with the first of our Trackside 6 specials for 2012. This year's race follows one of the most exciting finishes in 500 history that saw Dan Weldon win his second 500. But this year's race also bittersweet following Dan's death at Las Vegas. There will be plenty of tributes here throughout the month. Not the least of which is this memorable image from Victory Lane just last year that adorns every race ticket. Plus, fans will get to see his likeness on the Borg Warner Trophy, a lasting tribute that continues tonight to a man who made such a connection with IndyCar fans everywhere. In a sport where legacies are measured by numbers, Dan Weldon was as calculated as it gets. After rising through the ranks of Toyota Atlantics and Indy Lights, he landed as a test driver for Honda and then Panther Racing, the top 10 finish at Chicago in his first race. It sent him to Andretti Green, waving to the crowd, being introduced as the new teammate in 2003, joining the likes of Michael, and Dario Franchitti, and Tony Kanaan. It didn't take long before he stole the show. His first win at Twin Ring Motegi in 2004, backing it up with a win at Richmond just two months later. But here comes a celebration. Two little smoky donuts for Dan Weldon. The Clyde George Jim Beam car is always strong. Even when we qualify bad, there's a reason for it, and we just keep working. So uh, my boy's in the pits as well. His team concept took him to Indy a year later, again stealing the show, passing Danica Patrick for the lead, and eventually giving Michael Andretti his first win at the Brickyard. This is what I wanted to win. I came into this year wanting to win the Indianapolis 500. Oh! <laughs> I, I want to thank my three teammates because they, they've, developed, they've developed me into, into a, an Indianapolis 500 champion, and without them, I wouldn't have done it. And his career really took off from there. Talk shows from New York to L.A. We caught up with him at the Chicago Auto Show, where he was a guest. Now I'm going to show you another car that I like. Come. Vamos. The Ferrari 430, but this is the Spider. I like the convertible. He stayed at Andretti Green for two more years before Chip Ganassi pestered him into joining his championship team. Oh, no, see, see this, is, this is the boss calling. Uh -oh, this is Mr. Chip Ganassi. Ganassi. Hey, I'm just uh, doing a, a live interview. You're, you're on live TV on RTV6 <laughs> in Indy. He loves racing. I've been with bosses before, but the guy, the guy. Just lives, breathes, eats, sleeps. He's really. sick. With Chip, he immediately won the 24 Hours of Daytona, and there was talk that he might hook up with Ganassi's NASCAR team as well. Now that's something people have said, like, yeah. can they even understand me? But I've got my, I've got my accent. As I was getting on the gas out of turn three, I got that whole accent. <laughs> I'm working it. I'm working it. He was single in his 20s and absolutely doing what he loved. You feel really at home when you're just inside that cockpit. I mean, is, it, is that your home away from home, where you are right now? Not even home to me. It's not as comfortable as this environment. It's, you know, I have no worries when I'm in He also enjoyed style, a man of style and substance, you might say. The debut of Dan Weldon's outfit for race day. Weldon routinely unveiled his 500 race day look for it, with shoes as loud as the cars he drove, and a constant theme on all of his helmets, dating back to his Indy Lights day. The, the owner of the kart team that I drove for, the mechanic, always said that I drove with a lot of heart. So hence Richard the Lionheart. He always Apparently, when he went to battle, he always fought with a lot of heart, and not always his head. His heart totally, uh, totally overruled everything. So that that was that was why that's been placed on the helmet. That's pretty cool. The Brit had plenty of heart. Whether it was an extra autograph or a hat for a young fan. Who's your favorite driver? The Weldon. After marrying his assistant Susie, it was back to Panther Racing, but his passion remained. I love the, uh, the Indianapolis 500. That's a race that really captures me emotionally. And as you can probably tell by just me being here, yeah. I'm uh, 
<laughs> I've been a little feisty You're tonight. You're pretty I'm amped up, aren't I'm you? I'm excited to get on the track, so I'm looking forward to it. So when Brian heard a call to offer him a ride last year with a shot at winning Indy again, he couldn't say no. And Indy's history books were glad he didn't. Here he comes, the National Guard machine with J.R. Hildebrand down along the white line. He is sputtering slow and he hits the wall. He hits the wall coming out of four. Who will win? Who is the winner? Weldon. Of the Indian, Dan Weldon. Weldon. Dan Weldon has won the race. Yeah. Oh, guys, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I said to myself, I want to make sure that uh, I... Um, when I'm sitting on the beach with my family that I'd done everything in my power to potentially win the race and I wasn't going to lift for anything. I, I think uh, my wife will give me a little bit of a break now because uh, I've been probably a pain to deal with lately just because I was so desperate to win this and you know you can't forget that it is the 100th anniversary and so to, to, to be you know the winner for this particular year is, is very very special but I'm proud to be a two-time winner too. Recently, I sat down with Susie Welton to talk about how she's been holding up since that day in October, and she wanted to thank race fans everywhere for all the support they've shown her over the last six months. The 2012 IndyCar season has been one of some significant changes. New cars, new engines, new drivers with new teams, and all those changes have played a factor in the first four races of the season. But one thing remains clear, the old favorites will be the ones to beat at Indy again but several drivers are ready for a breakthrough at the Brickyard. From the very start of the season, one thing was clear. Penske Racing was the team to beat. Will Power won the pole position at St. Petersburg, but come race day, it was Elio Castroneves leading the way. The Chevys were clearly faster than Honda and Lotus, and Castroneves took the bow tie back to victory lane. But since then, it's been Will Power's world with everyone else chasing him. An easy win at Barber Motorsports Park on April 1st set the tone. Very satisfying winning like that, winning to nine. Power followed that up with a masterful performance at Long Beach. He started 12th after Chevy's engine changes forced a grid penalty, but there was power in victory lane. When you start back there and you really don't think it's possible to win, it just shows how strong our team is. And again on the streets of Sao Paulo, Power won pole and barely gave up the lead, picking up his third straight win. For Roger Penske, four for four to start the year, the first time he's done that in 40 plus years of racing. Some of the other big names are struggling. Scott Dixon and Dario Franchitti have had a combo of bad luck and bad mistakes, leaving them sixth and tenth in points. Similar situations for guys like Marco Andretti and Graham Rahal. Some fresh faces near the top of the standings. James Hinchcliffe and Ryan Hunter Ray are third and fourth coming to Indy, both for Andretti Autosport. As for picking a favorite as they come to Indy, that's easy. Getting the favorite to victory lane at Indy, well, there's 500 miles and 32 other drivers to decide that. Prior to Weldon's win last year, five straight winners had started on the front row, the longest such stretch in the race's history. In fact, 42 of the 95 previous champions started on the front row, which adds a little more pressure to pole day next weekend. He's tasted the milk in Victory Lane here in Indianapolis, but now Dario Franchitti has another mission on the track that he believes is just as important as becoming champion again. I sit down with him to talk about that next. And no sign of Danica Patrick in this year's Indy 500 field, but we found another young driver who might be on deck while hoping to blaze her own trail to Indy. You'll meet her coming up when Trackside 6 continues from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Welcome back to this Trackside 6 special on the road to this year's Indianapolis 500. We are here at the IMS Hall of Fame Museum with the Board Warner Trophy, representing a century of champions here at the track. Well, none of those victories took as long to decide as the one 10 years ago in 2002. That's when Elio Castroneves won his second 500, but not without controversy. Paul Tracy claimed he was the winner, but was moved back to second place when IRL officials ruled he illegally passed Castroneves during a yellow flag on the final lap. The fight finally ended July 3rd, when IRL President Tony George rejected the appeal from Tracy's team. You know, it's been an interesting start to the season for a two-time Indy 500 champion, Dario Franchitti. Struggles through the first three races of the season before a fifth place finish at Brazil two weeks ago, but no one can blame him. He's a man with plenty on his mind, although certainly another trip to victory lane here at Indy has become Dario's dedication. 
If you're ever looking for Dario Franchitti, the best place to find him is likely Victory Lane. Two-time winner in India, four-time series champ, and he's still going, no luck needed. Good luck, Dario. Not bad for a guy who contemplated retirement in 2007. In years past, I always used to look, you know, I've got this plan, I'm going to retire at this point. That it's, went out the window, didn't it? Out the window about <laughs> five years ago, yeah. Instead, he's embraced the sport even more. And at this point, retirement's not an option. He still has another year left on his contract with Target Chip Ganassi. And as sure as changes come in the series, change has come with Frank Keedy. I mean, are you more laid back now than maybe oh, you were? Yeah. yeah. I think I'm more laid back for sure. Um, in some ways, more confident in what I'm doing, uh, but definitely more laid back. And at times a bit more reflective, although he admits as he approaches his 40s, he's got plenty of room to grow. You never know what to expect, and maybe you don't enjoy the moment as much as you should. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'm pretty bad for that, because I'm yeah. kind of a pessimist <laughs> in life, so I don't really maybe enjoy those moments like you say. I, I take this pretty seriously, probably more serious than I should. And it'll be Weldon's second victory on the year. There are plenty of proud moments, among them 2005, when the Andretti Green race team swept the top four spots at St. Petersburg, led by his teammate Dan Weldon, with Tony Kanaan finishing second, Dario third, and Brian Herta fourth. We used to say to ourselves, and the, the four teammates, other people on the team, we'll never have this again. And I think we all realized we probably wouldn't. And it was true. Which takes Frank Keaty to the heart-wrenching moments. In 1999, he lost his friend Greg Moore to an accident at the California Speedway. Then last October, losing Weldon to the accident at Las Vegas. Returning and racing this season becomes an incredibly difficult exercise in managing emotions. I think I'm still at the stage that it's difficult to remember the, ha the happy memories right now, it's still the pain. And that happened when, when we lost Greg too. And it took a few years before I could just enjoy his me the fun memories without the pain. So it's, it's tough, man. But I will say, Dave, yeah. when, when I get to the track and I put my, my race head on, I don't let, I can't, and I can't, and I don't let thoughts like that get in my head. Well, you're I a just, professional. Yeah. I mean, that's what you do. I switch off and, and my focus is all on that car back there and working with these guys and trying to make it the fastest thing around here and trying to win the race. But as he puts on his gloves every weekend, he also takes them off. Frank Keedy, along with Kanan and Justin Wilson, lead up the Drivers Association, fighting for changes in the name of safety, be it the car or racetrack. The loss of friends will not be in vain. That's what I'd like me personally, Dan's legacy to be. That was really the thing that kick-started it, you know, with, with, with Greg's death, that I think really moved things on in, in safety. It should never have happened, Not very much like Dan's should never have happened. Um, and it, the, 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 if there's anything positive about it, it's that it accelerates safety. And Dario's had little problem with acceleration. So the race now to once again add his likeness to the Borg Warner Trophy and ideally combine his 2010 win with Weldon's trip to victory lane last year, creating a bookend. There are others who are overdue, but friends need to stick together, as they always have. I'm very proud that my likeness is next to Dan's, and um, you know, I'd love, I'd love to, as you said, I'd love to be on the other side too. Um, at some point, I'd love to see Tony's beautiful face on the speaking board. Speaking of overdue. Yeah, speaking of overdue. <laughs> I mean, if somebody deserves it at some point, it's, it's definitely Tony. Um, but trust me, I want to win it badly. We'll see if we can make that happen. A lot of drivers celebrate birthdays this month, and Dario is one of them. Turns 39 on pole day. He's a savvy veteran who still wouldn't mind a little more experience right here on race day. Well, she's training in hopes of becoming a superstar in IndyCar, and she has special motivation on top of her right foot. What does it mean? She'll tell us next on the special edition of Trackside 6.
Welcome back to the Speedway Hall of Fame Museum. Now take a look at this car. In 1973, Gordon Johncock drove it to his first victory at Indy. Well, just 30 years ago in 1982, his win over Rick Mears was one of the most thrilling finishes and at the time the closest in 500 history, a margin of 0.16 seconds. Of course, the name you won't hear much of this month is Danica Patrick. Danica, of course, moved on to NASCAR be her first 500 that she'll miss since her rookie year in 2005. So it begs the question, who's the next American woman in the sport? Well, how about another Midwestern girl? Meet a young lady named Shannon. And Mac is ready to make her move. It looks and somewhat sounds like an Indy car, but the series is called USF 2000. And Shannon McIntosh is determined to make it her ride to Indy. You know, to be at the IZOD IndyCar level and winning and, and, you know, being competitive is what has to happen for me. There are no alternatives. No. Call it a numbers game right now. The car says 18, although she's 22, and actually started racing when she was just five. I remember to this day sitting in the car for the first time. We were at a quarter midget race. And I said, Dad, you know, I want to do this. And he's like, heck yeah. Not a lot of dads would probably go that way. Heck yeah. Her mom, a teacher's assistant, and her dad, a machinist, both working to pay the racing bills. In fact, they all saw it coming when Shannon was given her first bicycle. And I used to ride around my bike as fast as I could and have my dad count how many laps I could do. And this is before I raced. So I think it was just... Uh, meant to be. And I was going to say, you were born to do this. I think so. It's in my blood. She started racing in USAC's Ford Focus Series at age 16. All that before striking out on her own, moving to St. Petersburg, Florida a year ago, finding sponsorship and a condo in the shadows of Tropicana Field, home of the Tampa Bay Rays. That's like the classic story of you know, a young person just loading up their car and just driving someplace and then setting up shop. I'm kind of crazy like that. I mean, I'll, I'm pretty much what I, what it, whatever it takes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it happen. A calculated risk in a sport that's frankly full of. But I don't watch TV. I don't play. I never played with toys. Still don't play with toys. Um, <laughs> I hope. But, but you drive them. <laughs> but I drive them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nothing simulates the life of a racer, but this comes close. You can like, come on, make changes on the car and stuff like that. Spending hours upon hours here with an occasional break. Taking a cue in attitude, including a not so subtle reminder, thanks to a tattoo in Japanese. It says Nintai. Yeah. It is a Japanese term and kind of a whole way of thinking is pers perseverance, mm -hmm. never ever give up, and it's on the right foot for a reason. I was going to say, is it the right foot because that's the throttle foot? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course, all of this comes after another young woman leaves IndyCar. Danica Patrick turn heads on the track and off with appearances in a number of media. Show me cheeky. Yeah. McIntosh is getting her fair share of attention as well, taking part in a 17 magazine photo shoot. It's all a part of the package these days. I started when I was five. I didn't start because, one, I didn't start because I wanted to be a girl race car driver. I was oblivious to it and completely, you know, had no idea until I got older. Uh, and then I'm completely different. My background is different. I really try to be my own person and, and kind of just... You're almost oblivious to whatever she did or what, what uh, her career was. In a way. But she does know the overriding storyline with women in motorsports, the fact no woman has won an Indy, at least not yet. I like the Indy 500 books, kind of a subtle reminder of what the goal here is, yeah? Yeah, the Indy 500 itself is just an amazing event. So to be able to start you know, getting the groundwork and, and learning these cars to be able to be there one day, it's, it's cool. Shannon is originally from Miamisburg, Ohio, but time is very much on her side. Considering Danica made her move to IndyCar, she was 23. If Shannon maintains her pace, she'll be 24. So what do you need to know when you come to the opening weekend at the track? Those answers next on our Trackside 6 special. Day first, Brad Brown back for a final time here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And if history holds true, Brad, 
we could be seeing another down to the wire finish in this year's race. Yeah, we talked about 1982 and Gordon John Cox win. Well, of course, 20 years ago, 1992, still the closest finish in Indy 500 history. Al Unser Jr. starting from row eight, worked his way through the field. He and Scott Goodyear battled down to the wire and at the line, little Al winning by .043 seconds, the slimmest of margins. You can still hear Bob Jenkins' voice reverberating after that great call to the finish for Al Unser Jr. 1992. Well, the track activity begins on Saturday. Practice begins at high noon, noon to six here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The gates will actually open at 10 a.m. and the events will include the celebration of automobiles throughout the day and the presentation of the 2012 pace car at 1130. Practice will continue on Sunday. Same schedule. Gates open at 10, practice from noon to six. But also, you can ask your questions of race control during a morning session at Pagoda Plaza. And mark your calendar for these dates if you haven't already. Poll day next Saturday, May 19th. Bump day Sunday, the following day, May 20th. Carb day Friday, May 25th. And of course, race day Sunday, May 27th. The green flag drops at high noon. Well, you know the names. Elio Castroneves, Tony Kanan, and Gilles DeFerrin, and you likely know their popularity here at the Speedway. But just how well do you know the lifestyles of this Brazilian bunch away from the races? We'll take you inside their lives in South Florida. That's next Thursday, 7.30, here on RTV6. Well, that wraps it up for our first Trackside 6 special. We hope you'll join us for our coverage the entire month of May. The coverage has only just begun. For all of us here at RTV6, for Brad Brown, I'm Dave First. Good night for now from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway.